Hello everyone, uh, welcome to today's live stream uh, where I will solve all the web category challenges from Nahamcon CTF. As some of you know, I s spoke at Nahamcon CTF where we talk about debugging and I also played the CTF. Initially, I only wanted to play maybe one or two tasks, uh, but I got sucked in on Friday and I sat through whole Friday, whole Saturday uh, and I was just enjoying it too much to stop and I had to, to solve all the tasks. Actually, I solved uh, all of them but one on Friday and then whole Saturday I spent on, uh, on the DEF CON task, which we'll cover in the end. Uh, but we'll start from the beginning, from the easy tasks and uh, let's go for Jurassic Park. Just uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for, for joining. If you can confirm on the chat that everything's working well, you can see stuff, you can hear me. Um, and if I get uh, a few confirmations, we'll start with the challenges. All good. I hear from the from the chat. So let's go. Uh, hello, hello everyone. Hi Morsin. Hi Tekka. Uh, hello, first name, last name. Hello everyone. So let's start the first ta task, Jurassic Park. Um, usually the easiest tasks uh, on CTFs are either the flag is embedded in the HTML comment or it's inside the uh, robots.txt file. In this case, it's inside the robots.txt file. In case you don't know, robots.txt is a file which tells search engines like Google where they are not allowed to enter. So this file exists on many websites. It's a standard file. And this one tells Google that it can't browse through engine directory. And this is a very good idea to, to check this first. Indeed, we have a, a directory listing here and the flag txt file which is right here and this is the first challenge uh, we will not uh, not stop too long uh, here but we'll skip to the next challenge which is called extravagant and um, the, the the description on the xml parsing service which suggests it might be an xee uh, so xml external entities and uh, considering this is an easy task, again, it's probably not going to be and uh, have any complications. And when we uh, start, when we open the challenge, it might take a few seconds. We have here two endpoints, two websites that are actually doing something. The first one allows us to, uh, to upload a file. I have an example file here. Here I get an information that the upload was successful and then I can view this file uh, in here. So let's skip to uh, to burp. I have these requests prepared here. This is the upload request. It basically has nothing, uh, nothing strange, just the, uh, this, the normal uh, file in the body of the request. One more thing that I need to check is the port number because I did this on the previous instance and if you want to look for uh, for XXE uh, the, the basic payload that you can use is on the Hacktricks hack tricks repository generally uh, this is very helpful very helpful cheat sheet with uh, with all the basic payloads uh, book.hacktricks.xyz and this is uh, there are a lot of information and I can tell you from my experience that it is verified, it is checked and it works in a lot of cases. Um, I think for, for a long time, for me, like the main repository to, to go look for basic payloads were, was payloads, all the things from, from GitHub. Now I think um, I prefer this one, Hacktricks first. And if we browse to that, this is exactly the file that I have here. And when I send the request, nothing happens in the response, but I need to copy the name of the file 
and I need to uh, to put it here and it takes a while to uh, to process I will look uh, the stream does stutter from time to time that text I think with the stuttering I can't do much um, I hope it will be acceptable uh, but I will increase the, the font size on the challenges uh, so you can you can see that this of course timed out because I didn't change the port number which I should which is this one and now when I send the request I see that the file I've sent it was this and what happened here we have the uh, the, the part here which is the header tells the that it's an XML this uh, means that the, it's like a variable we assign the value number three uh, to variable to replace inside the document called foo which this one doesn't matter this name does matter and here inside the, the XML uh, which is similar to, to HTML actually HTML is an XML uh, inside we have a value one here and then value to replace in the beginning uh, and there is an ampersand and there is a semicolon there and in the response we can see that instead of uh, the number uh, the, the the whole word here we have the number three which means that it, it replaced uh, the value to replace with the number three but apart from being a normal string variables we can also have system entities which allow us to also include uh, local files it also allows us to make requests so this can also be used for ssrfs in this case uh, we just write this um, this file because in the challenge description there is information that uh, the flag is inside var www folder i saw on discord that some of you uh, spent an hour on this challenge just because uh, they, they were looking uh, for the directory with the flag, which is right here. And when we upload uh, this file, again, it's a text test.xml uh, file. It fails to connect, which I don't know uh, why it did. Did I not change the, the port number here? I didn't. So the upload is successful. The same request to, to read the flag and all of a sudden with our entities we have the flag uh, text in your browser is very small i will make that a longest uh, hack tricks it's it's a website with uh, with those payloads i didn't use hack vector uh, but maybe will in the future the stream is lagging sometimes um, can't really do do much uh, with it right now if my my connection was good when I tested it I just turned off the music and I hope it will be all right so uh, that's the flag to the extravagant challenge actually I didn't solve it that quickly um, this one took me more time than it should because uh, you see no matter what you put here if it's a valid XML invalid XML whatever it just response with the same and for a for a long time i would say for for a few tens of requests i was just getting upload successful res response here and then the this this file this endpoint if you just put a non-existing file name here it just returned 200 okay response with with nothing and for a long time i i think i was i was pasting this basic payload um, and apparently it didn't work I just couldn't uh, couldn't use this this very simple entity I didn't even try to read the file I, I tried with, with like a simple entity maybe that this was uh, a slightly different payload and just wrote upload successful here and then nothing uh, in the response and I, I don't know what what did I do wrong but f for some time it's because it's an easy task and I didn't need to waste time on it but but when I finished all other exercises I just wanted to, to really uh, have all from the web completed and not uh, all apart from the one uh, easy the stream died which which I don't like uh, it looks okay now 
I would like a confirmation on the chat that indeed it's fine. Um, and before before this gets to you, let's uh, I will repeat myself. So there is flag variable, which very much uh, what we are interested in, and then users variable with the list of names which we don't really care about. And then the flag is appended to uh, users and back again and good i see on the chat so uh so let's continue and we can see that there is one endpoint on this application uh, it handles both gets and posts this this part handles gets nothing interesting here no parameters we are interested in the post request and the name parameter is taken uh, from our input directly but setting is also taken from our input but it's cast into the integer so uh, if I would try to use setting A here, there's an internal server error because it can't convert the letter A to the setting. Mm, and then the name is, um, I think, uppercase or, so, or the, the first letter of the name is, uh, is removed. And then there is the regular expression, which will debug in a second. And our setting is also there as the last argument of the find all method. To understand this regex, uh, I will use a website called debugex, uh, which is very useful for, uh, for, understanding, for understanding regexes because it visualizes, uh, it visualizes what happens here. So before we, we dive deep into that, uh, we can see that our results results are filtered by this regular expression and then uh, the template in the result uh, contains those uh, those filtered values so our goal here is uh, to create uh, the input which will force this regular expression to include the flag because normally our flag is is not included i can try to uh, to look for the flag pattern here nothing shows up so uh, we need to understand why and we need to to basically create the input which will uh, give us the flag and uh, i will copy the flag from the previous challenge to debug x and this tool it is very useful here i pasted my regular expression which i don't know what it does at the moment i choose python because it's a python script and then here's the flag and what we need to do is to create such a regular expression that this flag will be matched. In this case, uh, we can see it's not matched, so something must be fixed. And what happens in this regular expression? First, there is a capital letter. And I can already see that this is the problem, because our flag starts with a lowercase letter and the regex has a capital letter. Then it matches zero or more uh, lowercase letters and then between uh, another set of lowercase letters, there's our input. So uh, we know that this, the beginning won't match, uh, then the part flag will match with no problems because it's a lowercase uh, letter of lowercase letters. Then the uh, opening curly bracket also won't match and the same goes for, for the closing bracket. As our input, uh, we could use the the wildcard basically, so the dot uh, zero or, or more times, it doesn't really matter. But importantly, uh, remember that we also control the setting. The setting, which is the third argument of the find all method. And if we Google the docs uh, find all for Python, we can see that there are flags like ignore case ignore case that allow us to do case insensitive matching which means it doesn't matter if our input is lowercase or uppercase so if we turn this on in debugx we can see that our input does match in this case with this simple simple expression but the problem is that uh, the, the docs say about using the the flag in this format re dot ignore case and in our code, we can see that the parameter setting 
is casted into the integer, into the number. So, so it won't work in our case and we need to find out what is the value of the ignore case uh, flag because under the hood, actually all these flags are integers. Under the hood, all these flags work just as numbers and we can also put numbers there um, to, uh, to control those arguments, but we don't know what is the int value of the ignore case flag. So for that, I will just open a Python console, import re module because it's from regular expressions and then just print out re dot ignore case. And I can see that the value of ignore case flag casted to the int is two. So uh, I can come back to burp and I can prepare uh, prepare the regular expression. I already have, have done that. The setting is number two. And here I decided to have a little bit more uh, concrete regular expression, which will match the flag. So, so my input is, is this. It basically will uh, match that this first, this first set will match the letter F. Then my part will match the letters L, A, G the opening bracket, anything in between, because I didn't remember how long the flag is, and then the closing bracket. And if I replay this request, but I need to set up the proper port number, we can see that in the results, we only have the flag. If I would only use anything zero or more times, this would work too, but it will, would also give us uh, other names, which doesn't really uh, help, but the flag is also there. Hello, Sharad, how are you doing? So there is the flag for the third challenge. And with this, we have finished um, all our easy or our easy level uh, tasks and I will stop these instances and let's now step into the first MIDI one, which is called Flask Metal Alchemist. This one uh, has a list of uh, atomic, um, I don't really know how this is called, but we can search through, through those metals and uh, there are the results. We can also control how uh, they are sorted in this table. And importantly, we also um, have the, the source code for this challenge, which I have um, opened right here. And it looks uh, like this. I will jump to the main file, to the, to the controller. We can see how it looks um, under the hood first, maybe I will show you the, the request. How does the request look? It has two parameters. Uh, regex is always a pain <laughs> indeed. Regex, a pain for, for developers, but, but for us, it's an it's opportunity, I would say. And this request to, uh, to the challenge to, to searching through those metals has also two parameters, search and order. And in this case, it was ordered by atomic number. And let's see at the source code. We see that uh, this part handles the post, post request and it simply takes our parameters here. If the order is not specified because it's not required, we just uh, query the um, metal object by uh, this function and our input is right here. This uppercase name suggests it's using an ORM. So in another, in another file, probably in, in models file, we have specified the, um, the table and the, every metal has uh, atomic number, symbol and a name. And in this case, if, if you see that the developers are using an ORM, so they are querying the database like this, it's usually a good solution. It's usually um, not sus susceptible to, to the SQL injection. At, unless, uh, in this case, the order by is used in, insecurely. So filtering by metals is done in the secure way. At least I didn't 
uh, find a way to, to break this, but it's the order by clause that's vulnerable to SQL injection. I actually find this quite surprising because it does not look um, vulnerable at the first sight. If I would be a developer, I would not expect this to be vulnerable to SQL injection, but turns out it is. And um, I felt this based on the on the challenge structure, but uh, I wouldn't wouldn't think about this if I would audit this this source code. So again, we have the the injection inside the order by clause, and it is a bit problematic because we can't just uh, use union and add the flag, uh, but we will have to to think about it more. I actually run this challenge locally so I can um, I can see the, da the database uh, contents and I have them available right here. Here are all the methods I can query uh, and there is also the table with flag uh, which only has one column called uh, called flag uh, with with our flag this is of course the the test flag which I inserted into the database. In case uh, you will ask, this uh, extension is called SQLite Explorer for, for VS Code and it allows me to, to query the database live. So um, our, our uh, query will be uh, something like this. So first there's just a simple uh, select from methods, we can run this query, we can see all the methods. And then uh, let's add the order by clause and let's just use name here and run the query again. We can see that the order of those methods changes uh, and when I add the order by clause. And there, this is our injection point and the question is what can we do with this? Actually, this is very simple to one of my previous videos about uh, life overflows challenge where there also was an SQL injection, the blind SQL injection with the injection point inside the order by clause. I think the reason uh, these are quite popular is because SQL map can't exploit them. So it makes uh, the, the players uh, write their own scripts. And this is the case here. And we can't just add union here, as I told you previously, even, even if I um, use the proper proper um, number of columns, it just will throw an error uh, because it doesn't allow union to be here. But what we can do is we can use the limit clause. So the limit clause uh, tells the database how many records do we want in response. And when we, when we want one, we will get one. When we want zero, we'll get zero. There are 92 uh, records in this database, so the limit can be as much as 92. And importantly, you can also have some function calls and subqueries in this point. For example, I could here use the Unicode function with the input, let's say, capital A. And when I run this query, I can get 65 requests, uh, 65 records in the response is because the ASCII code of the capital letter A is 65. If I choose the next letter from the alphabet, it returns 66. Uh, if we open the ASCII table here, we'll see that indeed uh, these, are, these are corresponding um, values from the database. And we can see we are caring about the decimal. In this case, capital A has, six, has 65, capital B has 66. So this way we can extract uh, one character of a flag at a time because uh, we can go further and instead of mm, only having the, um, the Unicode call here, we can also uh, have subquery. So here I can write in the parentheses, select Unicode and when I run the query, it does the same. It essentially does the same in this case, but I, I can have a select here. So in the limit clause, after the, the order by clause, I can't have union select, but I can select something as a subquery in this case, and it returns a number. And I can link this number by using the number of 
records. So, uh, leaking the, the ASCII code of, uh, of the character capital A doesn't really help us. But before we, we get into extracting the flag itself, let's uh, consider some problems. Because when we come back to the ASCII table, we can see that uh, lowercase letters are up to 122 ASCII code. In the description of the challenge, we can see that the format of the flag is lowercase letters with underscores. So let's see, lowercase letters are here from uh, 97 to 122, then um, opening and closing of the brackets is here, and then the underscore is 95. And we can see that if we would uh, change our query for a lowercase z letter and run the query, we get 92 records. If we change this to x, we still get 92 records because there is not enough records in the database, so it will only return uh, 92 at maximum. It won't return more. So in this case, what I can do is I can subtract any number from this uh, from this query to then add this number again because um, 65 is the ASCII code of the capital letter A and everything that will be every, any character in the flag that would be before A uh, would return zero rows but in this case there are no su such characters so if I do this then for uh, for uppercase A I have zero rows for uppercase B, I have one row, but importantly, if I have a Z letter, there are 55 records, and if there, are, there is another letter, there are 55. So there is still the differentiation at the end of the range. And now what I need to do is to replace this part with the part of the uh, flag. And um, of course I can't have the whole flag here, but I can have the part. In this case, I will copy this code from the exploit. And there are two functions here, uh, actually one function and one select. So first there is uh, the simple select, which is select flag from flag, uh, which returns our flag. And I, I'm using a substr function, which uh, takes this whole input, so this will be our flag, and then takes takes uh, one character starting from one. So in this case, if I run this, I get a syntax error because there are improper number of uh, parentheses. Let's see, uh, let's see where I have too much of them. Maybe here. Indeed, uh, for the first letter of the flag, I have 37 rows. If I would cut this part out and have the letter F here, it will return 37 as well, which means I successfully with this input leaked the first character of the flag. Now what I need to do is increment this to two and I'm leaking the second character of the flag and so on and so on. And here is the code um, that does this. It's very much aligned with, uh, with what I covered in BBR Premium lately because in the uh, second to last issue, I covered making requests from from Burp, so using from from Python, so using requests module, sending requests, sending parameters, how to do this. And in the last issue, I covered using beautiful SOAP, so parsing HTML responses. And uh, in this case, I specify the URL, which uh, I will go ahead and change the port number to a current one. Um, then I just tell that I don't know the flag yet and I also initialize the character variable and the i variable is equal to one and then this is my uh, this, these are my parameters so I have no search I don't really need this parameter all I care about is this uh, this order parameter and it's simply the same thing I have here so I just could just copy this uh, and the only change is with each next request I increment this parameter by one because I've in the first request I will leak the first character of the flag, then I will leak the second, the third, and so on and so on. And uh, with each uh, iteration of this loop, I will leak the next character of the flag 
until I lick the closing bracket, which will mean that I have the flag on my computer. Then I also have um, making request uh, using request module. I also proxy this through burp so I can see everything through burp. And they, then I initialize the beautiful soap module, which allows me to easily query the, um, the HTML of the response. It parses it and gives me a nice interface to, um, to ask it. And then what I care about is I care about how many metals were returned in the response. So I just find all TR elements. TR stands for table row uh, because this, this thing is a HTML table and each row means another metal. So uh, I find all TR elements in the response using this, this code. I care about how many of them uh, are there. So I take the length of this table and then I add the 65 again because I subtracted the 65 here. So I need to add it here again, uh, which means that this variable character ASCII contains the ASCII code of the currently leaked character. And then uh, I, with the chr function, uh, I cast it back uh, to being a character from the int. I add it to the flag and I print the flag. Let's, um, let's run this, uh, this program with another terminal and we can see that it prints the flag one character by one character. This is what this code here does. And all of a sudden we have the flag. Yes, the Danilo. Uh, it's the, the standard case where you leak uh, one bit of information at a time and you do binary search to find the character of the flag. But um, that requires, that method requires many more requests. In this case, I just send one request per, uh, per character of the flag. So I like doing this, but of course uh, that method only would work. Getsko asks, what if the table had only one row? Would it still 96 still work? So if the table would have more than one row, then I would uh, here in this select, it only returns uh, one column. If there would be more flags for some reason, I would lead uh, limit one here. And it would then again, like return the string because with, if, if there would be like limit two and there would be two rows, it would return a collection of or whatever it's called and substring function does not take uh, more than one string so so it would probably throw, throw an error so i would just go for limit one it would again return a string and again this would work so uh nice solution thank you danilo uh, and with that we can skip to uh, to the next task, which finally is the first hard one called hacker TS. In this challenge, we start um, with a website that allows us to customize a t-shirt um, and we can print whatever we want on the t-shirt. Importantly, this is an image. Uh, so the backend probably opens a headless browser, creates an HTML with our input, and then makes a screenshot of that website um, to then uh, returns us the screenshot. We can also uh, think that considering that the response usually takes a lot of time, which suggests that the backend really uh, has to start the headless browser and, and make the screenshot because it takes a lot of time and resources. And also we have the, the admin button here, but when we click it, this page can only be seen internally, localhost 5000, which is a very clear hint that this is an SSRF task because uh, first we have the, the image generation, which we know can be susceptible to, to SSRF using, using XSS. And then this message just confirms uh, this is the case. So what you need to do is you need to create um, an input that will 
exfiltrate the flag that will make a request to the localhost 5000 and then send you the response back to your server. We can first confirm that we can um, control the, the, the body, we can control the JavaScript by just querying, um, querying our collaborator instance. In this case, it's uh, blocked probably because I didn't use the HTTP protocol. So I run this again. Uh, it again has an error about uh, parse error. Because, oh, okay, because this didn't return uh, a proper JS, obviously. So there, there's an error, but we should see that it did make a request and it indeed there is a request. We also can see the, the library they use to, to generate an image. And uh, this confirms first that we have uh, internet access uh, to, if we can reach our server, it also confirms that it does try to execute scripts. And so script tags, so we have everything that we need to, to exfiltrate uh, the flag. So this part is, uh, is boring, so I'm happy that I already have this this request, uh, this uh, this proof of concept ready. This was a hacker TS, and this is the simple uh, JavaScript code that um, opens, creates a new X HTTP object, um, and on the on getting a response, it sends another request this time to our collaborator instance, and in the first request we open the localhost 5000 slash admin address. Mm, and then when the response to this request is handled, this code gets executed, which sends the body to our server. Uh, what we need to do here is to change the collaborator address. And uh, this is pretty much the, the whole exploit. I will just need to, to paste it. I can probably do it here, although it might not work from the browser due to some encoding problems. And let's see if the uh, we, ha we can see that something was sent to the collaborator server. It's encoded, um, but is the flag here? If the flag is here, we can search for it. Yes, here is the flag. Uh, if, we, if we decode this, here is our flag. It was, it was sent to us. It actually thought that there are a few parameters. Basically, the whole response from the admin uh, from the admin endpoint was sent to us. And to be honest, I thought that this will be a bit more complicated, that I will then have to do one more action as the administrator. But it was actually the end of this. I would probably mm, consider this uh, a medium uh, medium level challenge, like comparing to the other ones on this CTF. Oh, get comment if there's only one row in metal stable. Um, yeah, in, the, in this case, it, it you would have to do a binary search. In the, the challenge I spoke about earlier from uh, created by life, life overflow, then there, it was like searching through blog posts. And first I had to write the script that added 127 posts. So then I can use this method to, um, to exfiltrate the flag because, uh, because there just wasn't enough blog posts. Normally there were like five, but then it was worth it because the server was really slow and, uh, and the, this trick allowed me to, to get the first blood on the challenge. So uh, that's the first hard challenge um, done. Let's skip to the next one, which was two, four, one. 
and in this case uh, we had access to a secret vault uh, where we could uh, store our uh, our secrets the the environment hasn't started yet so i'll take a look at the chat i am late sorry how many hello wrench um i finished uh, Easy's, I finished uh, medium, the medium, and I finished hacker TS, and I'm now stepping to the to the most interesting ones, which is two for one Polar and Defcon. So th this Fort Knox um, challenge, I can sign up here uh, as as the as the hacker, and the application wants us to set up two-factor authentication. So normally. Uh, you would need to do this with your phone, but this is not really um, convenient way, to, way to, to test applications to have those QR codes in your phone. So let's take a look at the request. After sign up, we can see that it looks like this. And there's basically a secret, uh, which is like shared by my 2FA device and the server. So what I can use is I can use Google Authenticator extension to Burp. It is available here and it is uh, it is free it does not require uh, the pro version and it basically takes the secret as the input and generates the 2fa code as the output and it is very useful for for testing purposes i would prefer if i could just copy this uh, because i will have to uh, to uh, like switch between tabs and, and look for it and for some reason Sometimes it does output uh, codes that are shorter than um, than six characters, and they seem to not work. Or maybe I have to put it trailing zero. Okay, it does it does work. So I can now create a new secret with the a name test value secret, um, and then to see it, I also need the two FA OTP code. So I need to. I need to write this down and I can see the value of the secret. Let's see the, the requests that were that were under the hood. Uh, there are two parameters, OTP and the secret ID, and the response has the value secret. The first thing we should check is if the OTP is required, if we can maybe bypass this, maybe provide many OTPs and so on and so forth. I didn't find anything wrong with this particular with this particular functionality so uh, let's go to settings and see what is here we can see that we can change the the password which also requires the 2fa but we can also reset two-factor authentication with one click uh, so we can see that there's post to reset 2fa endpoint and in the response there is another secret which we can again um, put to google authenticator extension and uh, it doesn't ask for the preview OTP, it doesn't ask for a password, so that's clearly insecure, but it is not immediately exploitable unless we can uh, have a CSRF or an XSS. And here at the bottom, we have the feedback form, which definitely suggests that there might be um, an XSS. And in this case, uh, I will again just use uh, script uh, source to confirm using Burp Collaborator that it does uh, have access to the internet and it does try to make a connection to my server. The first time I was doing this, I used XSS Hunter, which is like properly used for this, but it is not necessary. I can see the request here. Indeed, uh, it tries to to include a script from my my website. So I know that I need to uh, create an XSS payload that will um, give me the secret of another user. Because in this case, uh, the first thing that I, I think is that the flag is in the secret of another user of the, of the admin that was created when the application was first launched. Um, so there's probably a chain of, of a few vulnerabilities. One thing that I thought about is about changing the password of the administrator and logging as the administrator, which uh, which you can do with, with one request and then you can log in as the admin, uh, but you need the OTP, so you need to first 
reset the 2FA and then uh, change password. I, I don't know if this was the intended solution because I didn't even use the change password uh, functionality at all. What I did was I first wanted to reset the 2FA to be able to access the, um, the, the secret and then I accessed the secret using the same XSS payload. So there are two requests that my XSS payload must send. Um, so let's start creating the payload. And I don't know how about you, but I am not very good at, uh, at JavaScript. And what I prefer to do in this case is to go to the network tab in developer tools, click the reset to FA button. And then when you have the request here in the developer tools, I hope this is visible because developer tools um, are not magnified, uh, but you click the right, uh, right mouse button, copy, and then copy as fetch. And copy as fetch um, looks like this. It basically creates a JavaScript snippet that makes requests to this endpoint. It also has all the headers, um, has the body, has the method and so on. So I use this method to create uh, my payloads for, for things like this. And um, this was the, the first one. Actually, most of these headers are not necessary, but I just did not have a reason to, to remove them. And my initial idea for this challenge was that I would um, first reset the 2FA, then I would leak the secret to me using Burp Collaborator, and then I would send a second payload with uh, the, the request that shows a secret. Uh, and also exfiltrates the secret to my instance. But it didn't work. I don't really know why it didn't work, but, but I know that it, it didn't. So what I ended up doing is I ended up with a single payload that did both. So first it sends a request to, to reset to FA function. So it resets uh, the administrator password, then, um, in the response, I know there is a secret and I included some JavaScript code that allows me to generate an OTP code using the JavaScript. So, <coughs> so I didn't need the verb extension. I didn't need anything like this. Um, with this line of code, if I included um, these, two, these two packages, with this line of code, um, I can generate a an OTP code provided that I have the secret. So I extract the secret from the response uh, using this regular expression. And basically now I don't need to exfiltrate the secret, create an OTP and send the second payload to, to exfiltrate the, the flag. Uh, but I have one payload that first resets the password, then creates an OTP code. And with this OTP code sends a second request uh, to show secret endpoint, which leaks the flag. And we can see that our, our secret, the secret that I created, it had the ID uh, number three. So I knew that the flag will be either number two or number one. Uh, number two didn't work. So I tried with secret number one and it did work. Uh, so let's now try this, but I will just need to update the port number first. This doesn't matter, but I will change it as well. And let's get another collaborator address. It's here actually, uh, recently the, the collaborator addresses don't end with verb collaborator net, but ostify.com, I have no idea what this is. And I will now copy this whole payload and paste it here as the feedback. And I will now read the chat to see what is happening. Did I check J JSON attack? Um, yeah, I think the JSON attacks might are also things that I should test here, but I actually, um, I didn't. I, when I saw the, the feedback form, I, I knew that this is the intended solution. And uh, we can see that indeed I have a request in Verb Collaborator that leaks the flag to me uh, with 
from the admin so this is the payload that eventually worked and with that we have two more challenges left and i would say that um, all these challenges up until now i pretty much flashed um, and these two were were really were really interesting so um, I will actually start with Puller, even though it has less solves, it only has 36, while Defcon has 45. But for me, the, the Puller one was, was easier, um, and I solved it after a few hours, and then I struggled a lot with Defcon, so we'll, um, we'll jump to that at the end. In the Puller application, uh, we have some functionality which doesn't really matter, but let's see what it does. Uh, it is a, an application that uh, allows us to sign up. So we'll do that and we'll then log in. And what it does is um, it, it has some polls which doesn't, don't really do much. Mm, there is something, but, but it isn't indicative of, of some kind of vulnerability. Like previously, we had the admin panel, which indicated SSRF. We had the feedback form, which indicates blind XSS. In this case, there was nothing. Um, so I was thinking that maybe I should brute force this. Uh, maybe I should uh, check check a few known, known directories. But uh, I saw that in the HTML of the website, there is uh, the comment with the GitHub repository. So. I knew that this is the, the lead that, that I need to investigate. And we can see that there is the source code of this, of this application. Uh, let's zoom this in. I browsed through all the, all the source, source code. And um, one thing that you should look for when, when looking through the source code of a CTF challenge is where is the flag? Because usually the flag should be added at the beginning to the database if it's an SQL injection task. It should be added as a node if it's a like a vault as in the previous previous task. So this is what you should be looking for. And if you find nothing, then probably uh, the bug it might be something like an RCE. So in this case, nothing in the source code indicated no strange behavior, no strange code. Mm, so I didn't know what to look for until. I saw that uh, in one of the files, in one of one of the commits, there is a message about a secret key, and there is a secret key that's used to sign cookies. And we can also see from um, from the settings, from the settings here, that it uses Pico Serializer to uh, to to handle user session. Pico, if you don't know, it's a serialized Python object, so we can basically create an object and then your cookie is actually a Python object which the app has to deserialize every single time you send a request. But this is cryptographically signed and the verification of the signature is before the deserialization. So you need to know the secret key uh, to have the deserialization. And this is one of the methods to exploit leaked secret keys. So when the secret is leaked, you can then create your own cookie with your malicious object and when the server deserializes the object you get an RCE. So um, for a long time I was trying to, um, to create my own cookie or actually instead of creating your own cookie the first thing you should do is to verify your current cookie. So uh, this is challenge called puller. Uh, so this is the code that that I used and the first thing that that you should care about is something like this. So you have the cookie and you have the secret key and uh, you try to deserialize it. If the, if the key is valid, if the verification is valid, you get no error. Uh, but for a long time, I was getting a message that the verification is not valid, which meant that this was not the key used to, to sign the cookie. And with cryptographic uh, stuff, it's always not that easy 
because there are a few functions. You don't know if it consumes bytes, if it consumes a string, if it consumes whatever else. So uh, in the middle of the challenge, I had like a for loop here and I tested this secret key uh, as string, as bytes. Uh, I also tested different default salts because I didn't know what salt is used, different functions to, to um, deserialize the cookie, but nothing worked. And then I thought that um, I will maybe run some secret scanning tool on the repository to, uh, to see if maybe there is something else. So I ran uh, the truffle hog, but truffle hog found nothing. It didn't even find the key that I knew that was sick, uh, leaked. It didn't even find this. So uh, I, I try, tried different options, but I still couldn't make it work. And I, to be honest, I don't know why I, I tried with the entropy uh, flag because I thought maybe this is the one, but it didn't. So I ran it with debug trace flags to see what it happens. It's actually the, the first time I did this. And there is a whole wall of text um, with mostly useless stuff. And by a stroke of luck uh, from this whole, of course, it looked differently when I was, was using a, a different zoom, not the one that I'm using now. But in this code, uh, I found the secret key. But to my surprise, it wasn't the secret key that I have here but a little, uh, a few lines higher, there is probably the, the other key. There it is. I saw this one first. And this is not the key that I had previously here. And I tried my for loop with this, this proper key uh, with, with those salts. And one of my setups actually worked. It was it was this time, this one that uses used uh, load method from Django core signing. Of course, this code, I, I didn't like come up with this. I Googled um, Django deserialization vulnerability and there are already write-ups that uh, that have the, the skeleton of this code. So you don't need to like start from scratch with, with these things. But in this case, um, I used these methods worked. I also tried uh, tried different ones, but they didn't. And also the, the salt, uh, it was this one. I extracted these default salts from the source code. I didn't know if this or, or this one is used. It turned out to be this one. And when I had the this part, when I knew that the, I have the proper key that I can deserialize the cookie with, then I need to create an RCE payload. And it works like this, that you have to create an object and you have to use some special function that is executed um, always. So in this, in Python's case, it's a reduce function, which I don't even know what, what it does. But important thing for me is that it is executed once the object is deserialized. And it takes quite a strange, uh, strange, uh, like you, it returns the function as the first argument, but doesn't execute the function and then function arguments as the second. And I did spend quite a, a, a few, um, maybe not hours, but maybe an hour here trying to come up with a proper payload. The tool that you can use for that is ref shells, which uh, generates reverse shells for different setups. Uh, so you can specify the IP of your VPS, probably the port on which you listen. It generates an, a command which you have to run on the on your VPS. And then you have a lot of different um, comments that you can execute on the server, which should give you a reverse shell. In this case, um, it didn't work for a long time. I think I tried with bash shells. Uh, I tried with uh, with different files. It didn't work. I also, uh, at first, I tried to execute code here, like in the body of the reduce function, but this was executed on my computer instead of the server. So it didn't do anything. And also this tool has um, Python uh, shell here, and it returns you a Python code that gives you a shell. So there are more than one function calls. So it, at the beginning, I didn't know how can I like pack this whole shell inside this one reduce call, 
But finally, I came up that I, I can use the exec function, which executes the Python code. Um, and as the argument, I just pasted this code from here. And I think first I started with bash because I thought it's more likely to, to have bash shell installed. It didn't work. And then with the shell work, shell, uh, sh shell, it worked. I will just um, now add a my VPS IP here just to not leak it on the stream. There we go. And uh, we can change directory. I will also need to update the, the port of the currently attacked server. It's this one. Um, again, I'm using requests a module to send the request basically from here. And if you're wondering what this if does, is that I also had the local setup. So I was testing payloads first on my local application and only then I was sending them to the server. Uh, and right now we, we do not care about uh, that. And this, I guess, should be my VPS, but it's not. So I will log in here. And there we go. And right now uh, I have my VPS listening for the connection. And when I run the exploit script, uh, I can see here the deserialized cookie and I have received a connection from the server. I execute the ID command. Mm, it is even running as root. So uh, it's very, very serious. And then cut flag txt thus returns us the flag to the puller challenge. And that's the solution to the least solved challenge from Dana Hamcon CTF. Not, not the America. I don't know what is this challenge. Um, I am only solving today uh, challenges from the web category because these are the only ones I, I solved because I don't like play CTF to play CTF. I just play CTF to to have some fun and uh, publish my web hacking skills. So I didn't. I thought that maybe if I will have time, I will try some crypto tasks. Uh, it's not crypto like cryptocurrency, but but the traditional crypto. But those uh, web stuff took me so much time that I didn't have uh, didn't have the, the mood to do this anymore. In the DEFCON tasks, uh, which is definitely the one that I spent the most time on. We can again see that there is uh, some generation of a PDF. In this case, there are two inputs, our name and our email. And I knew straight away um, that uh, in the email, you can only, if you have uh, an, an allow list of uh, these characters. So I did of course test if it, indeed only this can be used, but uh, didn't seem to be hackable. So I, I was pretty sure that it has to be in the email part and uh, in the email part, you can't just use any tags here because it says that the email is not RFC 5322 compliant. And I knew straight away what this means because uh, I covered in VBRE Premium the blog post about um, breaking email parsers about a few, uh, a few months ago. And so I knew straight away um, what should I do. It's this talk um, in BBRE Premium. We also have this, uh, we have notes from this talk that I created. And uh, straight away when I saw this, this bad request error, I knew that um, this is what I should do. So uh, I knew that the, this part can be quoted and you can inject uh, HTML tags inside, and this is a valid email. So, uh, so this is the 
the thing that that worked straight away i actually did this from my mobile on friday uh, evening when i just wanted to to see uh what this task task is and i thought that it is very easy uh, which uh, which backfired badly because what we couldn't use is we can't use the parentheses in this case we we see the information that uh, parentheses are not allowed in emails and note that this is a different error from the the one that was previously so uh, it looks like the the rfc check does have the uh, the email the parentheses allowed which which by the way is uh, is wrote here that they are allowed in the regex but are validated uh, later and the parentheses are blocked so this indicates that there is some regular expression to match if the email is rfc which whichever it was valid email and then there is a uh, an if or a block list or something that is supposed to filter those characters and at first i thought that this is another case of an xss so i tested a bunch of payloads for um like in the in the hacker ts task, task a bunch of payloads for ssrfs using file protocols iframes javascript code without um without parentheses i was able, i also had the local uh, the local setup with uh, the the tool that i could generate i could generate um my uh, i don't know where is it, where is it um, but i could generate those images locally so i tried locally some payloads and i confirmed after after some time that i am pretty sure that i cannot uh, execute javascript code in any way i thought that there is an csp S -S -CSP, uh, which blocks it so i tried with iframes with with different things uh, and uh, this was the point where i didn't know what to do in the meantime uh, one of uh, one one person that i saw on this chat uh, wrote to me about this task and between i responded to her she solved it and she told me that it's not an, an ssrf nor an xss and uh, what I, the first thing that I tried after, after she told me that is the template injection. If it is a template injection, and I saw that instead of seven times seven, I see forty nine in the response, and I was a bit angry with myself that I spent so much time, um, like with a tunnel vision on one particular vulnerability class that, that I thought it is present here, and I didn't um, like step out a bit to think about other things that may go wrong here but still with with uh, ssti you can't do much with uh, without parentheses sometimes in easier challenges uh, the flag you can see if you just print out config uh, which doesn't require printing variables of course doesn't require parentheses uh, so it prints a bunch of configuration options sometimes the flag is here or the secret key is here and you can make the des deserialization and the internet tells you about a bunch of variables that you can check um, to to find uh, different values from the application and i spent a few hours doing this but again no interesting variables i could find that would uh, move me forward so i uh, i had to to find another way i also and tried to to simply bypass this this validation i was at the point where i was pretty sure that this error this this bad request error is strange uh, because this is quite a strange message so there is probably something with this validation uh, and one of one of the things i tried is i tried with um, to just go to the website with unicode characters and see different encodings of this character. So I tried URL encoding, HTML encoding, uh, UTF-16, UTF uh, something else, different encodings. Then I also tried those uh, different characters. So superscript and uh, subscript, which also didn't work. So, so nothing from this worked. And then um, again, this, this is a, a place where, where I had to get a, get a tip. This time I wrote to a person uh, on on Naham's Naham uh, con Discord about this challenge to the person which didn't solve it yet, and b by the time this person responded to me, they solved it, 
and they, they gave me a tip, uh, something about non-ASCII characters. So I checked, checked these payloads again, and then uh, I started to, uh, to look more in the internet and I stumbled across this uh, hack the box uh, response about filtering, about Jinja SSTI, which is exactly the case here. This is Jinja SSTI server side template injection. And uh, under this, one of these responses tells about using the, uh, this is full width uh, parentheses. So I Googled this, I found the full width uh, character and I had the Python script by this time, which I used to, um, to test these things because when it comes to non-ASCII characters, I do not trust Burp at all. Uh, in, with these things, I always use uh, use Python or maybe curl or, or something like this, but uh, definitely not um, not Burp. Burp does strange things with non-ASCII characters, and this is the the RCE payload. Um, and I simply tried different characters instead of the parentheses there, and uh, all of a sudden, when I tried with uh, with this on this page fileformat.info, you can also see how to write this character in Python source code. So first I tried with a very simple payload. I tried with something like um, one to join with, with, those, uh, with those different full width parentheses. And when I saw that it did process those, um, those parentheses, those full width parentheses as the normal ones, I knew that I have this challenge solved. Uh, so I just, put them inside this RCE payload. Um, these are, th this is the opening parenthesis and this is the closing one. And this whole thing, it's a, it's the Python code to get an RCE from, from server side template ejection. I also didn't write this from scratch. This is, this has been built before. And then I add uh, the curly brackets on both sides of the payload. I need to change the the port of the challenge. This is the one that I can use now. And I just send the request to the ticket endpoint with those parameters. Uh, I also have burp as a proxy and I can see that um, if I execute this, this should uh, generate a, um, it generates a PDF. So in, in the terminal, I can't see anything so I have to see see in burp uh, I used there is the PDF extension but it like only worked for me the first time I saw I was opening a PDF so so uh, so now it seems to be working fine but it didn't back then and we can see that this payload generated a response with the flag uh, the command that was here was just cut flag txt at first I executed ls to list the directories uh, and files and mm, it was in the same directory and that's it this was the the last flag i was very much relieved for for having solved that because um, i spent a lot of time on this and i would be uh, very unhappy if i uh, ended up without solving this one so yeah this is uh, this is my uh, journey with the Hampton CTF. I definitely had a lot of fun. I think I should play CTFs more because I I know that I like them, but I also know they consume a lot of time and I'm talking that maybe I don't need to do this. It's too time consuming. I would rather do bug bounty. But when I, when I sit to a CTF, I'm absolutely sucked in and I absolutely love it. Uh, so, so I think I should play more. And I also learned a lot Mm, about about some attacks that were covered here, uh, you know some attacks you know maybe know about, uh, you know the theory, but doing this in practice is something else. It requires you also to to read new stuff, and definitely one thing that CTFs have over uh, different labs uh, is that in CTF you know there is a response, so you Google for a lot of different stuff to to get to the to your goal, and while googling that you just come up with many new things that you can learn uh, which are useful later so that's it uh, for
for this live stream. Thanks to everyone for, for attending. I hope you had a, as much fun as I did by doing the CTF. And uh, let's see you in another video.